So it should be the kind of the top. All right. It seems, it seems to be recording. So Great. Recording. Great. 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 So these are um, what you see on your screen is the some of the uh, the presenters, and I appreciate you uh, coming to join this join this webinar. And this is the uh, the global initiative for fiscal transparency webinar on open budget data case studies and, and a landscape research project as well. Thank you for taking time out of your day, wherever you're located, and what, in whatever time zone you sit, to join in this discussion of uh, these research projects, which are nearing completion. And your input today will be useful feedback prior to publishing the final reports in the coming weeks. Uh, GIFT, a uh, global initiative for fiscal transparency, is a multi-stakeholder action network working to advance and institutionalize global norms and significant continuous improvements on fiscal transparency, participation, and accountability in countries around the world. Uh, as open data in general and open budget data in particular becomes a popular way for citizens to monitor government spending, creative open budget data distribution channels are becoming available to improve public participation and hold government to account. So GIFT organized and commissioned four research projects to examine the landscape of the open budget data field as well as explore case studies of open budget data and actual use. So today's webinar will highlight some of the cross-cutting themes uh, across these research efforts. I'd now like to introduce the, the researchers. Each will take one minute, I know that's a challenge, but each will take a minute to briefly say who they are, where they work, uh, their background with open budget data, and describe their research project. Um, so just in alphabetical order, Aaron, I'd like to start with you first. So Aaron Feinstein, can you just introduce yourself for, uh, for a minute? Thanks, Aaron. I can't hear you. I think you can. Might be on mute, Aaron, perhaps. Yep. Sorry about that, everybody. Thanks, Timon. Um, uh, my name is Aaron Feinstein. I am based in Chicago. Currently work uh, for City Colleges of Chicago, which is a uh, higher ed institution here in Chicago as a project manager, working on uh, strategy uh, and uh, strategic planning work. Um, I've worked as a budget analyst for the New York City Council and worked on um, budget analysis for the City of Chicago Inspector General's office. Um, I've run some uh, transparency efforts both at the New York City Council and the City of Chicago Inspector General focused on budget data as well as other information. And uh, my case study has been focused on the city of Chicago, the Chicago Public Schools, which is the elementary and secondary education system here in Chicago, um, Cook County, which is a uh, another municipal government in the Chicago area, and then the city of New York as well. So looking at those, the open budget data eff efforts of those four governments. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Davis, Adieno, can you uh, introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are? Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Davis Adieno. I work for development initiatives uh, based at the Africa Hub uh, or the Africa Regional Offices in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I work as a capacity development manager uh, leading on the access to information uh, transparency and accountability and the data revolution stream of work. Um, development initiatives basically focuses on a lot of research uh, uh, analysis, uh, but more importantly, uh, facilitating access to information uh, to key decision makers to ensure that uh, uh, different resource flows across the, across the globe, um, uh, at the global level, regional, uh, national, and sub-national levels actually uh, uh, gets into the hands of the people who matter the most, uh, the key decision makers to ensure that uh, we allocate resources the way they're supposed to. Um, my case study basically looked at uh, how uh, civil society organizations in Kenya uh, are repurposing open budget data, uh, more specifically constituency development funds, um, and, uh, and uh, transforming these into key messages, reports, um, but also engaging uh, with citizens, uh, members of parliament, uh, the media and others uh, to ensure that uh, there is improved uh, transparency and accountability um, and, and effectiveness in the way the resources are being allocated and used. Thank you. Thanks, Davis, so much. Jonathan. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Gray, I'm a Director of Policy and Research at Open Knowledge, which is a uh, global civil society organization that works to open up um, 
information research and culture to benefit the lives of uh, citizens around the world. Um, I have a long-standing interest in um, budget data, spending data, and various other kinds of information about public money. Um, I was the uh, founder of a project called Where Does My Money Go?, um, which aimed to visually communicate um, to uh, citizens how uh, tax money um, was spent, um, and that uh, later kind of merged into another project called Open Spending, which again is sort of run by Open Knowledge. Um, our research uh, as part of this project uh, looked at, um, uh, we were doing the landscape analysis for what open bu budget data is, um, who is active around it, uh, what are the most prominent issues and arguments associated with it, uh, the best practices uh, for publishing it, and uh, looking at some of the different applications, outcomes, and impacts that it's had uh, to date. And we uh, used a combination of uh, quite an extensive review of existing uh, literature from both researchers and practitioners, as well as um, a, an empirical mapping um, based on an approach called uh, digital methods, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. I think I've got the uh, book just here, which um, we've, uh, was done in collaboration with the uh, University of Amsterdam. Uh, um, yeah, I'll speak a bit more about that uh, later. Thanks, Jonathan. So, Timon. Yeah, um, well, we are, <clears throat> well, I am Timon Takahashi. I work for the, uh, currently for the Ministry of Finance in Mexico. I am in the unit of coordination with uh, subnational governments. And I've been working on uh, budgetary issues for quite some time now, for over uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, both as a researcher and as a uh, public servant. And um, I have to make this disclosure announcement, of course, uh, since I'm a um, current uh, a public servant at the Ministry of Finance. All my opinions and my <laughs> comments on this webinar and in the uh, research are uh, only me and Miguel, and of course does not uh, uh, imply anything that the Ministry of Finance may or may not say about it. So. Uh, I just want to say say that, and uh, Miguel is uh, also uh, part of the Mexican team. Oh, uh, my name is Miguel Salamanca. I uh, have experience as, uh, well, within the federal government. I have experience as a transparency liaison. Um, I've worked in also as a researcher as part of civil society in matters of public finance and uh, public spending. Um, in this regard, I guess. Uh, I have a long-standing, too, uh, interest in transparency uh, as experience, moreover, as an operator of uh, the rules than uh, as a researcher in this case, but um, I've also done uh, quite a bit of work of research uh, in regards to uh, transparency. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's, that's a little bit of my experience. And, yeah, and about uh, our case study is uh, on uh, Transparencia Presupuestaria website, which is uh, the website for uh, the federal government and particularly for the Ministry of Finance, where you can find all um, budgetary data available. And uh, it's mainly uh, oriented to uh, um, the civil society and NGOs and, and academia and, and organizations, uh, not necessarily certainly within the, the federal government, but it's used also for uh, um, by some of the units uh, within the federal uh, government. Would you like to add something? Yes. No. Um, yeah. So thank you for the invite and uh, I'm Thank you, Timon and Miguel. So the last person to, to introduce herself is uh, the respondent for our conversation today, and her name is uh, Lorena Rivero de Paso, and she's, like I said, she's a member of the, the GIFT team. So she'll start off each of the Q&A portions after the thematic discussion. So I just wanted Lorena to, to say hello and introduce herself. Hi, my name is Lorena Rivero. As Randall just told you, I'm part of the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency with a experience in fiscal transparency, exactly uh, implementing websites in, in government and now working as part of civil society. So please meet you all. 
Thanks, Lorena. So the first uh, the first theme uh, that we're going to look at, and the, and the presenters will each take a, uh, a couple minutes, three minutes, to talk about how this theme is uh, part of their research is on open budget data. That is, what is open budget data? Uh, it seems like a fundamental one, and be important to have that definition out for this conversation. So each of the researchers, starting with uh, the general landscape from Jonathan, each of the researchers will talk about what is open budget data in the context of their research and their project, um, the interviews they conducted, the literature they read, and the resources they found. So Jonathan, maybe you can start us off with a, a couple, three minutes of what is open budget data um, from your research, and I'll give you the, the power to present uh, some, some images for those viewing now. Great. Uh, let me just check. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Okay. Great. Um, so, yeah, as part of our research, uh, we reviewed um, existing definitions of open budget data um, uh, in the literature and also on the basis, uh, you know, or material that we uh, derived from our mapping. Um, and we found uh, not that many, a handful of explicit definitions of open budget data. Uh, uh, including from um, some researchers at Zeppelin University, uh, led by Professor Jörn von Lucke, um, a 2013 report from the World Bank, which I'm sure we're going to be discussing more uh, later in the webinar, which was called uh, Financial Management Information Systems and Open Budget Data, uh, as well as uh, a blog post from GIFT um, in, in January, so from uh, the network itself. Uh, Many of these explicitly refer or link to uh, previous definitions and principles of open data and open uh, government data. Um, and our review of these definitions suggests that the openness of open budget data is predominantly intended uh, uh, in, in this sort of sense of um, uh, legal and technical reusability as opposed to um, other senses of openness, um, for example, uh, uh, participation and accountability mechanisms as you see in sort of open budgeting, open contracting and open uh, government more broadly. Um, so really uh, many of the definitions that are already out there uh, focus on this legal and technical reusability uh, and uh, of what, um, just reviewing three uh, examples here, uh, most of them have quite a broad understanding of um, uh, public financial information. Um, which often includes um, government revenues, allocations and expenditures. Um, so it's not just budget planning, but also uh, quite granular information on each of these things. Um, so drawing on uh, some of these existing uh, definitions, we've proposed um, synthesized definitions of open budget data as well as closely associated terms such as open spending data and open fiscal data. Uh, both of which recurred uh, a fair bit in some of the literature and um, the materials that we looked at. Uh, and according to these definitions, the term open budget data would cover um, public financial information uh, which is used in the budget cycle, cycle um, and it would stipulate that this is freely available in machine-readable format to use, modify and share. Um, and we've included uh, as per opendefinition.org, which is um, quite a wide um, set of principles, uh, quite a widely uh, cited, I should say, a set of principles uh, for open data. Uh, similarly, uh, open spending data would be uh, open data about public expenditure and open fiscal data would be the broadest category uh, that would include uh, all kinds of information about public finance, including extra budgetary funds and all forms of revets, uh, revenues, assets and liabilities. Uh, and following previous definitions, we've opted to keep uh, these three definitions uh, simple and uh, we have uh, reviewed principles and best practices around the publication of open budget data uh, later on in the report, which we can loop back to um, as and when we have time. Um, and so I guess you can see also in this diagram, um, uh, there's open budget data uh, which intersects with open spending data. So it's clear that uh, in many of the existing definitions, uh, granular uh, information about public expenditure was included they also recognize there may be um, information about public expenditure which is not used in the budget cycle um, of budget spending. And then um, there may be a whole bunch of stuff uh, that's not included either in open budget data or open spending data, um, including 
uh, extra budgetary funds and other forms of revenues, assets and liabilities as per um, the previous discussion. So that's that's where we were um, on that. Great. Is that it, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can no. I can go on for ages, but I'm going to be there for now. <laughs> yes. Okay. So after that, uh, Timon and Miguel uh, will, will uh, discuss what they found in their research about what is open budget data in the context of the transpensive. Take yeah. it away. Can you see the, the PowerPoint? Looks good. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, regarding uh, open budget data in Mexico. All right. Uh, well, first of all, we took, uh, say, um, one of the definitions actually mentioned uh, by Jonathan. Uh, we took the uh, Tanner and Min definition, which states on uh, the accessibility of the public uh, to editable and reusable formats without restriction. Uh, in this regard, we approached the um, open budget data more of a, as an operative, uh, I don't know how to call it, but dimension. in a more operative you know, di dimension of it. Um, we took pretty much uh, focus, not much on what, what's out there, but what do people need um, in terms of you know, what, what is being offered and what people need. So in this sense, uh, open budget data for us meant um, I guess beyond the definition we used, uh, it actually meant you know the information being transferred from government units to the public um, according to their needs, according to their uh, you know, usage. And in this sense, we, we found a pretty wide um, uh, information availability. It really um, now the only lack of the, of the advancement in the federal arena is much more in a say, we, you know, we took a, a division of um, what kind of points of focus transparency could be, fo could be focused on. And uh, in this sense, open budget data was really extensive up to the point where decision making started. Like that's pretty much the only realm where decision, where open budget data is not available. So um, pretty much every key document within the you know, international standards is available we just there's you know a restriction given certain points of decision. So as Jonathan mentioned, um, within the use of, you know used if it's used in the budget cycle, um, I would like probably just to hear a little bit more what does used mean um, in terms is is whether it is in terms of planning or other specific points. But um, I don't know if you you want to add, add something. To that. Uh, yeah, well, um, as Miguel said, uh, we find that in Mexico, uh, uh, budget data, uh, what what is now available for uh, uh, people to look at, or for uh, uh, organizations of the civil society or uh, other institutions, is uh, following uh, Jonathan's uh, classification. Let's say. Uh, it's uh, the uh, all information uh, related to um, uh, spending data and fiscal data. Uh, what is not available, as Miguel said, is uh, for the information required for decision making. And I think that uh, in part this is due because uh, a decision making process in in the federal government are. Uh, very specific in terms of of who uh, decides what, and in, in that sense, well, information is uh, very restricted and uh, limited. Uh, its use is very limited to to the people that really needs to to have it and, and take a decision on that. But after decisions are made, uh, then uh, information start becoming uh, public. Let's say for the budget, uh, the, the budget draft is presented every year, and that information is all uh, available. But before that, uh, some of the uh, calculus or the scenarios that are uh, uh, put in place in order to decide 
the public, the budget draft uh, will will look uh, well uh, since they since those are uh, scenarios or working uh, uh, data well, uh, for decision making uh, that's not uh, available currently. But most of the uh, data is now uh, open and and can be uh, used. Great. So uh, that Thank from our part on open data. Thanks, Damon. Thanks, Miguel. And while Davis is getting ready to talk about the, the context, and Kenil, let me remind you that uh, you're welcome to add add uh, questions in the uh, the questions box in the in the in the webinar tool to uh, pose a question straight to uh, one of the presenters or a general question for all the presenters, and we'll handle those um, at the end of uh, Davis and then the at, after Aaron speaks. So, Davis. Davis might need to unmute your mic or phone. I think he's. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I hope everybody can see my my screen. Um, th thank you very much. Um, in, in the context of uh, East Africa, um, what what I found that uh, uh, when you talk about uh, open budget data, um, it, it it it's actually we have budget data that's available uh, to, to to citizens. Um, the challenge is that um, uh, when you look at the budget data in general, uh, most of it is available in published books um, and, and of course um, with the inception of uh, the Kenya Open Data Initiative, yes, uh, their efforts uh, to make this data publicly available uh, uh, to citizens of the Kenya Open Data Initiative. Uh, but when I narrow down to the Constituency Development Fund uh, uh, budget data, uh, I found, yes, uh, the Constituency Development Fund Board here in Kenya uh, makes uh, data available on disbursements, on allocations, um, on reallocations of projects. That is publicly uh, available and, of course, uh, anyone who can access uh, uh, the Internet then uh, can freely access it, uh, they can share it and, and use it. Um, the only challenge is I found that uh, there were significant uh, there were significant challenges um, in in terms of uh, um, access uh, because not not everyone has uh, has has internet access um, and then those who could access could only access certain types of uh, data sets. Um, now the bigger challenge was uh, modification uh, because uh, this data is made available in sometimes PDF. Uh, so you cannot find uh, what you can call analyzable formats, uh, uh, which then one can use uh, for, for any, any purpose. Um, when you talk about the use of this data, it's a totally different ballgame uh, altogether. Uh, um, the challenges there, uh, the, the government is quite keen uh, to know what people are using it on, um, and mostly uh, civil society organizations that um, uh, tend to use this data uh, face quite um, uh, some challenges especially for members of parliament who um, are always on the defensive about the misuse uh, of, of CDF funds, uh, which are meant for grassroots development at the constituency level uh, uh, here in Kenya. Um, when you talk about open budgets uh, or budgets generally, uh, people have to pay money uh, to buy the books uh, uh, at the government, uh, the government printer. Um, and these are bulky books which then uh, you have to convert if you are to access the latest, the latest uh, dat data on, on budgets, uh, on national budgets, um, you have to buy the book and then convert it uh, by scanning and then uh, converting it further from PDF to Excel uh, in order to analyze. Um, whatever is available on the Kenya Open Data Initiative uh, has some challenges uh, in terms of the comprehensiveness. Um, there are also challenges in timeliness. Uh, it, the, the data is not up to date, so you you will not find what you're looking for. And sometimes when you look back uh, uh, at a historical timeline, you'll find gaps in certain data sets missing, uh, which, which can be a challenge. Now, when I narrow down to CDF specifically, um, when I spoke to the uh, management of the Constituency Development Fund here in Kenya, they will not guarantee the accuracy of the data that they're putting up uh, 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 on, the, on, on their portal uh, or on their website. 
uh, basically because we have 290 constituencies. Um, each of these constituencies is uh, um, implementing projects on an annual basis uh, which could go into hundreds uh, of projects. And they have uh, some management structure and officers on the ground in each constituency who are supposed to go around and verify uh, that what is being implemented um, is actually what was agreed. Uh, but this process takes a long time uh, because of capacity capacity gaps. Um, on the data itself, uh, when it is available, a lot of civil society organizations then have uh, technical challenges um, uh, or inability to repurpose this data. So you find very few organizations are using uh, this data and using it effectively uh, to make sure that um, uh, they engage um, and, and, and uh, provide the necessary information to citizens uh, to enable or empower them uh, to demand uh, accountability. So this responsibility is largely left to a number of civil society organizations uh, who often government then uh, you know comes comes down quite heavy on them uh, and, and then the circle continues uh, of these challenges. Um, the other thing I found is that uh, uh, the civil society organizations were saying well we have open budget data to the extent that it is only being provided on the CDF board website. Um, anything beyond that, we don't consider it open data because um, the challenges in timeliness, accuracy, um, and, and, and other issues, including the lack of feedback, uh, feedback channels uh, for them to provide uh, this kind of uh, uh, um, feedback that then can enable um, um, uh, the government uh, or the CDF board to improve this over time. Yeah, I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Appreciate that overview. And Aaron, uh, if you can give us the, the overview of uh, what you found open budget data to mean within the context uh, of your research. Sure. Uh, let me give me a second to set up my my presenting. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, can you see my slides, everybody? Yes, they are visible. Okay. All right. So it's just one. So that, that makes it simple. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's been covered, the, the definition by my colleagues, um, sort of machine readable, um, having the data sets be easily exportable to uh, CSV or Excel or some sort of some sort of easily analyzable format like that. Um, looking at the four governments, I was I was working on uh, the three sort of Chicago area governments in New York City. Um, the types of data that are included in their sort of open budget data set definitions or what they consider to be da open budget data sets varies widely. Um, some just provide uh, the sort of budgeted appropriations at the beginning of the budget process and that's sort of the only open budget data set they provide. Others, or the Chicago Public Schools was, was the most detailed including the appropriated information but also um, historical spending detail, detail on capital spending, detail on uh, positions that are sort of part of the, that are obviously part of the budget process. Um, the, it, to sort of pick up on on what uh, the 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 Venn diagram that Jonathan um, presented, the intersection between open budget data and open spending data, a bunch of the users I talked to um, view the spending data as integral to being able to understand and interpret the open budget data. They want that historical spending information in order to sort of see trends and patterns and see is the sort of, it, especially if they're analyzing a proposed budget, is that an appropriate, you know, is the proposal appropriate, is it in line with past spending, how is it different from past spending, that historical data is really important to them. Um, so in the, in the governments I was looking at, they were, in terms of update frequency, they were mostly, the open budget data sets were mostly sort of integrated in, the release of them was integrated into the budget process calendar, so they'd be released with um, when, you know, it, when the, when the, typically the executive's budget was released, um, and that, and that sort of then the focal point of the budget process, the executive releases the budget, legislators analyze it in some way, maybe amend it, typically not in the cases of Chicago and New York. Um, but so that was the only time that the budget data sets were really being released. They weren't updated throughout the year, not even if there were mid-year 
um, changes or amendments to the budget, the budget data sets wouldn't change to reflect that. That was something users had had issues with. Um, one thing that becomes apparent is that that the open budget data sets that are being produced are really dictated by the underlying financial systems of the governments and the format of what the budget documents look like. I mean, largely what the governments, what these four governments, the three Chicago area and New York are putting out are CSV versions of the PDF documents they've been putting out for a long time, um, which, is, which is good. Obviously, users thought that was an improvement, but if users um, had issues uh, with the underlying structure of the, of the budget, if, there's, if the budget itself isn't transparent in certain ways, simply opening up the, the data so it's machine readable um, didn't really do a lot for them, and I'll talk about that more uh, maybe in the next, uh, in, 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 in a minute or two, but that, that I think that's good for now. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate that. And Lorena, um, back to you for your observations and, and questions and uh, starting off the, the Q&A portion, uh, looking at the major theme here of uh, what is open budget data. Well, as we can see, even even between our different researchers, we find differences in the conceptions of open budget data definitions. So this is an important topic to discuss and to reach a consensus about. So I would like to start with you, Jonathan, uh, making a few questions and tell us about the common misconceptions that you see in the use of the concept of open budget data. Sorry, say one more time the question. What is the common misconceptions that you see when people use the concept of open budget data? Uh, the the misconception about what open budget data is, or the misconceptions? Exactly. With, okay. Um, well, I mean, it, it was it was quite astounding that there was. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a bit, a bit um, more about this later. But um, one of the things that we did in our empirical uh, mapping of the state of the field of open budget data, um, over three quarters, I think, of the search engine results um, uh, that we sort of looked at, um, and there weren't very many, which indicates that open budget data as an issue is still relatively marginal in you know in the grand scheme of things. So there's not it's not a huge you know it's it's still quite a relatively niche. Uh, topic per se, like explicitly as open budget data. I mean, lots of people use sort of the phrase sort of open data about spending, open data budgets, and so on. But open budget data as a kind of phrase is still um, not hugely sort of widespread. Uh, but in over three quarters of uh, the cases where it was mentioned, there were um, explicit links to um, open data definitions and principles, indicating this is uh, very much a kind of uh, considered almost like a sub branch of open data, which is interesting given that there are lots of other forms of openness um, that are highly relevant in how um, information about public finance is then used, um, such as the uh, you know engagement of uh, citizens and civil society organisations sort of in, the, in around official sort of processes um, and uh, accountability mechanisms. Obviously, you know you have open budgeting, which does not just mean the disclosure of information but also uh, can mean the uh, participation of citizens in the kind of budgetary process. Same with open contracting, which can refer to both information about contracting, but also um, the processes around uh, contracting to ensure that there's uh, accountability mechanisms in place and um, there's uh, at least a sort of minimum degree of participation uh, enabled by civil society organizations to oversee and to intervene potentially into um, uh, cases of contracting. Um, so I think w w I would say that in terms of the misconceptions, I was, um, you know, what we found was there actually a high degree of consensus around um, uh, open budget data, meaning the absence of legal and technical restrictions. Um, the, 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 the differences in, in opinion, I think, were more around what that includes. Does it include documents or just structures, sort of data sets? Um, and again, sort of, it was interesting. On the one hand, you know, you saw some people saying, "Well, you know, open budget data is just about budgets." Um, others took it to mean the whole, um, you know, the budgets, as in like 
a very specific part of the overall budgeting cycle, namely sort of planning, basically. Um, whereas others said very clearly it's information to do with the whole budget cycle, which is planning, executing, evaluating, and hence um, quite granular information on expenditure um, or on revenues, revenues indeed will, will be relevant to the budget cycle and therefore sort of would be included. Um, so I think it was more on the budget data side where we saw sort of um, slight differences of opinion, um, whereas in relation to the open data side there was a high degree of consensus. Does that answer Yes, exactly what we were looking for, uh, a part of the consensus. And I would like to address some of the panelists and um, to talk about how advanced would you consider open budget data movement to be right now. And I would like um, Davis Adiano to give us a little bit of the background of, about this. How do you perceive that this movement has been advancing in the concepts what you're seeing in Kenya? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say open data, open data in general, is a fairly new concept um, here in Kenya. Um, and of course, as, as you may know, um, just in 2011, that's when Kenya launched uh, its national uh, open open data initiative. Now, when you talk about um, open open budget data, we've had budget data for the longest time, and like I said earlier, um, this has been published year in year out. Uh, in very big 1,000 page uh, uh, books of the estimates and uh, of course uh, approved, uh, uh, approved appropriations uh, by the national government. Um, now we've also devolved as a country so we no longer have a centralized system uh, of, of governance uh, where we have 47, 47 counties. Um, now these counties are also mandated by the law uh, to start publishing uh, their budgets and their data um, in, in, in ways that can facilitate um, engagement or uh, uh, citizens exercising uh, oversight, but this is not this is not happening. Uh, when you talk about open data, open budget data, um, it's still a relatively new concept. And when you go out to the streets, not many citizens will tell you or understand exactly what you're talking about uh, when you mention open budget data. Uh, civil society organizations are quite active. Um, in, in, in using uh, this data primarily because um, they actually engage in the budget uh, budget making process and, and of course uh, our constitution is very strong on citizen participation. So they write on the constitutional requirements and of course they have the Public Financial Management Act um, which is also quite strong on citizen participation in the budget making process. Um, but I can talk about the role of in, in intermediaries because Primarily, those are the people who um, uh, ensure that uh, lots of other community-based organizations or uh, civil society organizations that are not based in the capital city of Nairobi are then able to participate in the process by providing uh, information or analysis. And this includes the Institute of Economic Affairs, Development Initiatives, um, uh, National Taxpayers Association, uh, the Institute of Social Accountability. So, these are the people who understand the budget and the budget process very well and the open budgets, the whole concept of open budgets. Um, but below them you have institutions that are not interested in the concept of the open budget per se, but they need data and information that they can actually use to engage in the budget making process. Uh, so when you talk to them about open budgets, they'll tell you, yeah, yeah, sounds good, but can you give us information that we can actually use? to engage uh, and, and ensure that our priorities as citizens um, and other groups are factored into the budget making process. And can, are we able then to use the same data uh, or information uh, to actually monitor the way these expenditures are, are, are being made? So a lot of work needs to be done to take the whole concept of open budgets uh, uh, to another level. Uh, but I'll be playing for you a video clip of what some of the civil society organizations uh, uh, said about um, uh, uh, open budgets and essentially everybody is saying, well, open budgets are good, uh, but it's not the open budgets that do something, it's actually the citizens who do something. Uh, so it's important that open budgets then translate into information and key messages that then people can actually use to engage and uh, 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 ask duty bearers 
uh, to account for whatever they do with public resources. Thank you very much, David. And I'll let uh, Randall now uh, so that we can move to the next topic. Thanks, Verena. Uh, thanks, Davis and Jonathan. And there were a couple questions that were put into the question box, and, and uh, we'll get to those uh, in a moment. Good questions. Thank you for those. So on to uh, the theme number two about who. Who are the primary users? Who are the, the consumers and the publishers of open budget data? And how are they using and manipulating the data? What needs or questions or problems are they trying to address through the use uh, of, of open budget data? Aaron, I'd like to, to start off with you, if we can, to help us understand this question uh, from the, the Chicago and New York case. Sure. Um, all right, let's see. Do, do, do. All right. Um, can you see my slide? Just have to check every time. Yeah, that's good to check. Looks good. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's the slide from last time. There we go. Um, so I I talked to well I de identified four types of users. So um, uh, and they're they're typically I think what Davis was just referring to intermediaries or people the the prime consumers it seems to be are people who are reporters and civic organizations who sort of process the open budget data either into you know articles or news stories in some way um, uh, and then that information gets distributed to a wire, wider audience um, so r reporters um, are one of the prime users of open data or, or media, the media ge more generally. Um, and what I, what I heard from them is that they sort of are really focused on, uh, in, in terms of what they want out of open budget data, is they want all the information that the government decision makers have. And that's partly, I think, important because they want to analyze the decisions that the government is making and assess whether those are correct or just try to explain what's going on behind the scenes and what are the reasons for those decisions. Um, so there was some definitely frustration expressed with some of the with the existing open budget data being published, feeling that like they know that there is more um, more data behind the scenes, that there's more information that could be made available that isn't being made available for whatever reason. Um, one of the reporters I talked to in New York is a former budget analyst inside government, so he's well aware of what data is available if you are a government employee. And then, but working on the outside, very frustrating to see like much less information being made easily available to the public and to reporters like him now. Um, so. So yeah, I think they want, as much as possible, they want access to the underlying databases to the financial system itself. Um, that's sort of the, that's sort of the, the, what they're, what they're looking for. Um, reporters and civic organizations really focused on detailed information. A lot of the sort of, at least the, the bells and whistles of, of, uh, spending gra like a lot of graphical tools or dashboards that were included in the in the open budget data in New York and for the Chicago public schools um, a lot of the the reporters and civic organizations didn't find that information useful at all um, they thought that would was just sort of distracting for, for at least for their purposes um, so I think that that in those type that types of those graphical representations that at least in New York and Chicago seem fairly popular are more aimed at residents. Um, at least that's what the producers of open budget data were hoping for. That those that graphical tools and um, were that they would be using those to quickly access information, or uh, non-expert users could help these visualizations could sort of help them understand the budget data more. And that's sort of the residents in the slide that I'm that I'm presenting. Uh, I mean, I think the residents, the questions that they're trying to, to answer when they consume um, budget data is more around the services that they're consuming. So in the case of schools or um, 
residents are looking for how much is being spent on their schools, how might it compare to schools in, in other neighborhoods in, in their city, or, or if you're looking at something like police services, how does it, you know, how much is being spent on, my, in, on police in my neighborhood versus some other neighborhood, or is it increasing from year to year, those sorts of questions. Um, and then the, the, I talked to one sort of one for-profit private firm that works with a lot of open data generally in Chicago and I, they're, what they're focused on with open budget data and open data generally is trying to create uh, applications to allow non-experts to more easily access the information so they're that, that sort of the prime and to create I mean to the extent possible um, things uh, consumers might actually want to subscribe to or, or pay money for or something they could sell ads on. So something that, you know, might have a very wide applicability. Those are the sort of things they're looking for. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we'll go on to uh, Timon and Miguel to share with us their results from uh, the Mexico case. So briefly take us through who the users and producers are. Okay, uh, can you see your uh, slide? See the webcam, not the slide yet. Can you see it now? No? I can't yet, Timon. You do see it? I, d I don't yet. There it is. I, I can see it on my end. Can you? You're good, Timon. Okay, so it's on? Yes. Is it on? Yes. Okay, well, uh, in, in, in the Mexican case, uh, in particular in, in about Transparencia Presupuestaria, uh, we found that uh, um, the budget data is uh, very uh, customer-oriented. Uh, it's not... Uh, a tool that is uh, specifically uh, used or thought to be used uh, by the several units within the federal government, though uh, many units use it and, and its use within the federal government is increasing, but uh, it is very much oriented to uh, the civil society uh, and actually one of the main uh, strengths of the um, case uh, of Transparencia Presupuestaria is that uh, um, civil society organizations took a, a relevant role in the definition of uh, the website and what uh, should it uh, comprise and, and, and how the flow of information should go and, and they were uh, very much uh, into the discussions uh, um, and integrated in a working group that uh, made it possible to launch the the site uh, uh, four years ago, more or less. So um, this scope is the one that is uh, the most present in the case of, of Transparencia Presupuestaria. And in this case, um, the, the data and, and the way it's stored and the way it's uh, processed and, and the sort of uh, data that is uh, presented uh, considers this uh, very much uh, the audience that, that it will uh, reach and it, it's uh, been tried to uh, address a specific uh, key issues that may be uh, complex to understand for people that is not very uh, specialized in budgetary issues but then the uh, it, it's used uh, a very uh, down-the-ground uh, language and uh, the budget it's presented in, a, let's say, a citizen language or way, so it can be understood for uh, most of the people that uh, have access and, and, and do consult the, the site. Um, yeah, I mean, I would like to add something a little bit. Um, just that it's very interesting during the process of the website, uh, we've seen, oh, you know, the website has seen uh, a broader audience coming to the fore. And, and it's been really interesting the way that, you know, the way it was created, I, you know, it 
provoked or induced a certain type of you know information disclosure um, you know manner of, of working but then again uh, the site itself started being more proactive and the people in charge of the website started being more proactive uh, in terms of redefining its audience its target audience and in that sense uh, we've been seeing uh, well, you know we've been hearing and seeing a little bit um, from the organizations and uh, and academics uh, being more like say not distant but distanced um, of the center of the you know the platform and being turned into one of the audiences and in that sense I think we believe um, the website has been well this experience in particular has been really um, rich you know in terms of uh, who is the data consumer the data consumer has been broadened you know it, it started out as a civil society organization directed uh, you know experience for you know and it went from there to a more of a trying to include a broader array of citizens and uh, perspectives into the information disclosure. In this sense, it has been uh, really revealing of what data, you know, open budget data involves by making it uh, a wider, um, say, a wider meaning in terms of uh, what it becomes in society. Uh, open budget data can mean. Uh, it has a very interesting um, overview perspective, for instance, that is being brought um, as a new, say, uh, addition to the offer. And in that sense, uh, it has been really, uh, say, innovative experience, you know, for a federal uh, government unit to for overview um, functionalities within the website uh, for citizens to take over the, you know, the role of uh, watchdog. Uh, activities, I think it has been really, really interesting. In, the, in this sense, uh, even when the, the website was built for, uh, originally for civil society organizations and uh, academic endeavors, it has been really been widened. And in this sense, you know, uh, taking a uh, some of the points uh, mentioned before, um, it is a niche thing, like, I mean, because budget is a niche thing, uh, it's a niche subject. But um, I will leave that there is an, an option, there is a window of opportunity for open budget data to really mean something to citizens when it is configured in the proper way. And uh, we believe that you know, Transparency study has been a, an interesting uh, experience in this regard. Uh, we, we give back the word to Randall. Anything. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel and Timon. Appreciate that. So we're uh, coming up on, on the hour pretty quick here, and so Davis and, and, and Jonathan will have a few words to say, um, and we'll try and get to a, a couple questions after that pretty quick. So Davis, I know you had a, a, a video to show, and if that goes real quick, then go for it. Uh, if there's any challenges in that, then just take a pass on that so that uh, you and Jonathan both have a, a minute or two to, to talk. Okay, um, as, as I wait for the video uh, to just run over here, um, I'll, I'll quickly say that uh, uh, in, in this context, um, I mean, the, the, the core problem that a lot of uh, civil society organizations and the general public um, concerns itself with is that uh, when you look at the budget uh, and, and how the planning is done, both at the national level, the county level, sub-national level, um, then you, you see that uh, whatever is budgeted for and the available resources um, or finances uh, do not match. So there's always a competition between what is budgeted for, what is being uh, allocated, where is it going, what are the priorities for citizens, what are the priorities for politicians. Um, all those groups are competing for these limited, uh, limited resources. Um, what this results to is that um, in our quarter here in Kenya, um, information on how resources are being allocated uh, to different sectors um, and especially the more detailed uh, data and information on how finances are being allocated and spent uh, is, is quite difficult uh, uh, to come across. Um, so most of the civil society organizations um, and, and other stakeholders who engage or intend to repurpose um, open budget data do so um, in, in a bit to understand what exactly is happening uh, uh, and of course try to overcome the barrier of uh, if we know what is happening then we have a realistic chance of uh, um, 
uh, uh, you know, demanding transparency and accountability, and of course ensuring that uh, uh, the leaders are put to task to explain how they have uh, um, allocated their resources. Um, now, as a result of the lack of information, uh, citizen engagement is another big problem uh, in, in this context. So you find that citizens, in some instances, in a lot of instances, want to engage in the budget making process, but they do not have the, the data or the information necessary to do so. And where you have data, they cannot make sense of it. So you have you need the intermediaries then to come process that um, in a bit to um, enable them or facilitate engagement between the citizens themselves and um, uh, the leaders. Um, so to a large extent, uh, when, when I spoke to uh, the different people in Kenya, civil societies um, uh, who are seeking to empower citizens to exercise oversight over management of CDF specifically, and of course the tracking of uh, uh, um, uh, the tracking of uh, expenditure and exposing corruption stood out quite uh, uh, quite quite a lot. Um, and of course, legislators, members of parliament, in the context of CDF, were interested in how much was being allocated to their constituencies, how much was being dispersed, uh, uh, and, and you know what what exactly was happening. The CDF board itself, mainly concerning and the line ministry, uh, which is the Ministry of Planning here in Kenya concerning itself uh, with the monitoring of how, monitoring and reporting uh, uh, for, for, for legal purposes. Um, but most citizens actually wanted to understand what is happening uh, and um, with the information they hoped they could actually demand uh, accountability. There was a special category with, I found that uh, quite a lot of apps developers were interested uh, uh, in open budget data, students uh, and of course researchers like myself um, are the other category of people who are demanding, uh, are demanding, uh, or looking for this this data, um, and of course the media uh, works very closely. Uh, we found, that I actually found that a lot of journalists don't have the time to go to the portal itself or the website uh, and look for this data. So they rely on civil society organizations and other groups to repurpose this data, generate reports, uh, do some analysis. In which case, then they they quickly jump onto uh, uh, reporting. Uh, exactly. Uh, if, for example, funds had been lost, you find, as you can see on that screen, the media then picks this up uh, quite quite clearly and exposes what is what is actually happening um, at the constituency level. So, media uh, generally relies on civil society organisations and other groups uh, uh, to to ensure that uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, reporting is then done. Um, so they just like citizens, they rely on. Uh, um, they rely on intermediaries uh, to repurpose this data for, for them. Thanks, Davis. Thank you. And I want to say to those who are uh, still with us uh, a couple things. One, that uh, the, the video that Davis mentioned, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll post that to uh, the GIFT website uh, where the webinar was announced. And so you can see those videos. And I've had a sneak peek, and they're worth viewing. So if I can beg your indulgence for uh, about five more minutes, and then we'll kind of end the formal time. But like I said, we'll have time to have a general discussion uh, after Jonathan uh, does a little mini, mini presentation and Lorena asks some of the questions that uh, you've posed and then we'll have a more open session where some of the other questions that you've posed uh, can be addressed. So uh, Jonathan, if you'd take it away. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll be quite um, succinct in the interest of leaving more time for discussion. So I'll maybe skip over um, some of the um, methodology and sort of uh, highlight the results and then um, move on and then if people have questions about the methodology or um, uh, want to delve into any of the things that I'm showing in more detail then we can do that later. Um, but just very briefly, um, we uh, undertook a mapping of actors associated with the term open budget data on digital media. So of course that's not going to be uh, uh, exhaustive by any means in terms of who uh, uses that data, but we just wanted to kind of get a read of the actors and the different types of actors and how they're related and the kinds of things they do with open budget data. Um, so to start off with, um, we uh, created a list of uh, uh, organizations uh, who are active around open budget data uh, by triangulating several other lists. So um, the list that you see now is um, uh, organizations who are a member of at least two of uh, uh, a list of other lists that we had um, and that included um, expert organizations 
in the budget section of the Open Government Guide. Um, uh, key initiatives mentioned uh, by the World Bank's Open Budgets Portal and various other things. Um, so there's a few things we did with this. First of all, we uh, did a hyperlink analysis um, using the Digital Methods Initiatives Issue Crawler uh, to uh, start from all of these uh, different, the, the websites of these different organizations and then um, look at all of the pages that they linked to and then all of the pages that those pages linked to and then looked at how all those different pages were related. Um, and we uh, generated a network and then used the Gephi tool to do some analysis um, of, of that network and the sort of different uh, clusters within it. And you can uh, clearly distinguish in this diagram, um, just as sort of one example, uh, a um, group of civil, uh, sorry, um, intergovernmental organizations here. Um, you can see there's uh, some uh, a international aid and uh, aid transparency organizations here. Um, towards the bottom left, you can see um, there are a few uh, sort of open data organizations. Um, and and the, around the periphery, there are also uh, a, um, some, some organizations who uh, don't have transparency and open uh, government more generally as, as one of the main topics they work on. Um, but generally, I think it was uh, it, one thing that we were interested by is that the, net, uh, the network was dominated by uh, international and transnational act actors who work on open government um, and uh, regional and um, more issue-based civil society initiatives uh, tended to be more marginal and there weren't as many of them that explicitly sort of discussed open budget data. Um, so on the basis of this, we saw that Twitter was a major um, medium for, for communication as evidenced by the fact that so many organizations linked to it on their websites. Um, so we, undertake, uh, we undertook a, uh, an analysis of, um, start again from that same list of starting points, of the uh, different Twitter accounts that um, many of the different uh, starting points we took follow on Twitter. And again here you can see a sort of big cluster of um, uh, intergovernmental organizations on the left, you can see more sort of open data organizations on the right, um, development organizations at the top. Uh, but again, it's really sort of dominated in the middle and, and here you see, um, as with the sort of previous um, uh, uh, multilateral organizations like the Open Government Partnership, um, uh, linked to lots of these different clusters, so they appear to kind of play, as you might expect, a kind of mediating role between uh, in, in intergovernmental organizations, uh, governments, um, sort of aid, transparency organizations, and open data organizations. Um, and again, uh, you see here, uh, there are a greater diversity of civil society organizations in this network, um, including uh, notably anti-poverty, um, developed humanitarian organizations such as Oxfam, CAFOD, Save the Children, Doctors Without Borders, these kinds of organizations. And there is again a sort of noticeable presence of international, um, uh, English, particularly English language media outlets, but uh, it really is uh, sort of quite heavily dominated by a combination of IGOs and international um, CSOs and sort of multilaterals. Uh, so uh, another thing that we looked at was some of the different um, topics that the sort of, uh, groups are interested in, um, organizations who work around open budget data are interested in, um, and I'll maybe skip these for now and we'll return to them later. Uh, just based on search engine results that we looked at, we found, uh, again, a sort of similar thing that sort of CSOs and IGOs are quite close to the top. Uh, researchers were much more prominent in search engine results than they were sort of through the hyperlink analysis or sort of in Twitter. Um, and again, you see um, sort of international organizations right at the top. Um, US was very prominent. Germany was very prominent as well, um, uh, I think uh, partly because of the work um, that Jan von Lucke and um, others have been doing at the Zeppelin University. Um, I think maybe I'll pause on some of this, um, but we did also look uh, at how open budget data is being used. Uh, and just to, I guess, to briefly sort of mention uh, four of the main categories um, uh, that were most uh, prominent. Um, I guess, first of all, we had data visualizations, 
uh, and we sort of did an analysis of the kinds of functions of the different data visualizations and the kinds of things they're trying to communicate using sort of open budget data. Uh, there were various uh, forms of citizen budget monitoring initiatives. Uh, again, sort of, as mentioned before, there are quite a few of uh, journalists and media organizations using open budget data and um, uh, advocacy organizations, civil society organizations specifically trying to argue for um, changes to fiscal policy, um, whether that's um, changing the balance of allocations or um, some are also not, not, looks not only at expenditure but also at, uh, revenues that we're looking at. Um, for example, the uh, distribution of um, the tax burden on, on different um, parts of the population. So, um, but perhaps uh, I'll stop there for now um, in the interest of keeping lots of room for discussion. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Lorena, you want to take us through a couple of questions? And again, uh, please remain on the line if you can. If you need to uh, depart to another meeting, feel free to do that as well as this is uh, being recorded and you can catch it at a future time. So, Lorena, if you could just uh, a couple of uh, Sure. And um, hi. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I would like to go through a question that passed uh, for Timon Takahashi. In the case of Mexico, this was posted by Marco Fernandez. And he's asking, uh, what are the challenges to improve open budget and fiscal transparency in Mexico? He notices about different analysis that, they, that some of the documents have recently shown serious problems in the information consistency of the data shared in the documents presented in uh, the budget transparency website. Does your study uh, show the same uh, information and how could this be addressed? What are these challenges? Can you address this uh, topic a month? Sure. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, well, let's start saying that, uh, in our opinion, one of the main challenges that uh, are ahead of, of, uh, of us in Mexico uh, regarding uh, transparency and open budget data and and the project of uh, Transparencia Presupuestaria lies in the subnational governments. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a huge gap between uh, the quality and quantity of information provided by the federal government um, in regard with the, the, the information available uh, for uh, subnational governments. Uh, there, there, is, there is one uh, important step that has been taken in the normative arena, let's say, uh, regarding this issue, which is the uh, passed uh, in 2008 and with a uh, further uh, reform uh, in 2012 of a uh, general law of um, um, yeah, um, governmental uh, accounting, which uh, mandates all the subnational governments to uh, harmonize their uh, information on public finances. So <clears throat> that's uh, one relevant step, uh, I think, uh, in the normative side, but of course it, it should uh, become operative uh, to fully uh, um, benefit from, uh, from that uh, advance. And this is a complicated task for subnational governments. Uh, the institutional strength uh, in subnational governments is not uh, uh, like uh, the one of the federal government, so uh, some uh, subnational governments are very successful in these uh, tasks, but uh, others are not that much. So uh, the harmonization of the whole um, public finances across the, the country and, and the different levels of the government is still a, a, a great challenge that that should be uh, met. Um, once uh, that uh, is in a better position, well, uh, the flow of information should be uh, more um, integrated, let's say, and, and, and I think the aim of all this is that the subnational governments have at least the same quantity and quality of information available uh, that the federal government has, which I think, and this is my personal opinion, at this point is uh, uh, very advanced. And regarding the second part of the 
question, I will let uh, Miguel to say something about it. Oh, uh, well, I mean, just in response to the question, I believe that there has been um, a detected problem within civil society in Mexico regarding the consistency of data reported on uh, certain governmental websites. Now, the thing is that the, the way these sites are um, structured, the way the information is provided to them, is, well, I mean, we believe that it's very focused on keeping consistency of the proper data. However, there's been a problem um, of reports of changes being made to the databases. However, I don't know specifically, I mean, there could be that problem. There's a problem um, also uh, regarding the, the trustworthiness of the data being reported um, for, on behalf of civil society organizations. So I don't know specifically what kind of inconsistencies are we talking about here, uh, just that the problem has been recognized. However, the structure of uh, the offered information is, uh, has been you know, a, a major driver of this review of uh, you know, data consistency, availability, and as such, we believe that it's been actually part of that um, same second step of transparency within the Mexican experience. Um, the fact that today we can review and offer um, an analysis regarding you know, how consistent is the data, how precise it is, um, has been really, really a part of the second stage of transparency. So I don't know specifically what kind of uh, inconsistencies are we talking about here, but um, it, it has been, in fact, a debate in the national region regarding this issue. But um, you know, there are many, many areas of opportunity that people could argue. I, I would like to probably hear a little bit more if, uh, of a specific inconsistencies we're talking about, because I don't know exactly what, what, I'm, what am I supposed to respond to. Okay, thank you very much. And probably uh, Marco Fernandez would like to stay and maybe ask some uh, more questions to our uh, presenters in that matter. Um, now we have another question from Mark Joffa and Brett Wins. And they're both very related, so I'm going to address them. And I would like uh, mostly Jonathan Gray to please help us uh, give an answer to this one. Uh, they're asking if there is any initiative about for establishing a the presentation uh, of a standard for the formats of a budgetary data and the presentation of vocabularies for publishing open budget data, which would be very useful uh, in order to have this a uh, comparable. And uh, I don't know if you can address this, Jonathan. So, sorry, just to clarify, it's um, about ongoing work on standards for the publication um, of open budget data. As well as data vocabularies. Data vocabularies. Yes, uh, there are indeed, and there um, has been uh, some, well, I mean, let me just, let me just kind of uh, step back and sort of distinguish between several different things. Um, in our research, we, um, uh, we, we looked at, uh, in addition to um, best practices around open budget data, uh, we uh, looked at sort of the kinds of existing um, definitions and principles which are being alluded to, and I guess that's more um, included things like uh, the uh, comprehensiveness um, and some some stipulated what uh, open budget data should include, uh, and there were various um, uh, kinds of examples there. I mean, some ex explicitly sort of mentioned that off-budget fiscal data should be made available. Um, for example, the uh, Open Government Guide, the Sunlight Foundation, the U.S. Uh, public, public Interest Research sort of centers um, mentioned that, and and also said that information from quasi-governmental agencies should uh, be included. Uh, with regards to um, uh, data standards themselves. There's quite a bit of work that has been done and which might be relevant, and um, some of it quite well established, um, such as the classification, the UN's classification of functions of government, or COFOG um, standards. There's also um, the IMF's uh, GFSM 2001 uh, standards, and 
things like IATI uh, or the International Aid Transparency Initiative uh, standards and uh, some work from the World Bank's Boost Initiative as well as um, uh, the Open Spending Project's own work on um, data standards were in in some different areas becoming kind of uh, I don't know how to put it, but sort of de facto uh, moving towards components of standards. Uh, although I think there's a widespread recognition that further work in this area needs to be done. Um, I know that um, Open Knowledge has some ongoing work in the area of uh, open budget data um, standards. Um, uh, of which um, you know, we'll, we'll be kind of saying a bit more soon um, and publishing some of that soon. Um, with, with regards to the broader field, I think the main thing that I would say is there's quite a lot of discussion. Um, I guess uh, some of the interesting work has been uh, looking at um, intersectoral or sort of transnational standards, not just sort of within a country or within a sector, but like how you start to join up data from different um, sources and from different systems. Um, it seems like there is a strong interest in improving data standards and there is some on ongoing work around this topic. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that there is by any means at the moment a clear consensus around what those standards should be for open budget data. I think that seems to be something that's still uh, substantially in progress. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And finally, I would like Aaron, I, if you could tell us about some insights of how uh, could governments or CSOs help engage the missing stakeholders or help engage the uh, more society in the use of the information. Um, so one of the one of the suggestions by a couple of the reporters and organizations I talked to was for governments to provide um, more training to sort of actively engage either um, civic organizations um, uh, at various types of civic organizations and just sort of be go out to community organizations and explain the data sets, explain, provide definitions, provide things like data vocabularies or data dictionaries. Um, uh, one suggestion was to dedicate, and this was based off some of the data sharing done at the federal level in the states, um, to dedicate staff members to, to a hotline to answer questions about the data. Um, so provide phone numbers on websites um, so that anybody, reporters, citizens, organizations can call into the government and, hey, I don't really understand what this, this information I'm, I'm working on, what this field means, so they can sort of get that information. And this, this happens to, to an extent at the federal level in some data sets, and they thought that was sort of a, a best practice, because one of the things they're seeing is that as the data gets out there a little bit, they're seeing it public budget hearings, people who are sort of not experts in the budget data misuse or misinterpret the information and they think it means one thing. And so, you know, the, the whole, one of the big points of open budget data is to provide sort of more trust and transparency and accountability with citizens, with civil society. But then this misinterpretation of the data leads to sort of less trust, so it sort of backfires in some way. So they, that was one of the key things that I heard from a couple of the people I talked to. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll leave you, Randall, for some questions or conclusions. Great. Thank you for facilitating that, Lorena, and uh, the, the questions that were uh, typed in and answered, and if there have been some unanswered, we'll try and get back to you, uh, get back to you soon. So the, I appreciate your patience and, and sticking out and listening to the, uh, the discussions. I appreciate the, the effort of, of uh, entering some questions for everyone to see. And, um, there are opportunities on the on the website to to leave more questions. Um, you've been attentive uh, over the last hour plus, and if there are other un, uh, questions that you'd like answered, feel free to go to the the website and uh, the URL that's listed here on the uh, on this slide. Uh, a big thanks to our researchers and presenters uh, for their time as well, and uh, they'd be happy to follow up with the. Uh, answers to your questions if you want to send those either by email or post them publicly so that others can, can glean from the questions you might have by just adding a comment to the web page that's here on the slide. Um, again, thank you for your attention, thank you for your concern about this topic, and we will be posting 
the, the presentations that the uh, researchers used on uh, the webpage listed here. We'll also be following up with uh, the final reports when those are ready in the next handful of weeks. So check the space on the, on the GIF website for those products. And uh, as well, it's another plug for the, uh, the videos that uh, Davis has recorded uh, uh, interviewing some folks that will be up as well. So again, thanks to uh, all our presenters and uh, for everyone for the good questions and attentiveness this morning and this afternoon and this evening, wherever you are. So cheers. Thank you. Thank you.